Why bother with this work? Why bother observing? Why bother? What's the point? It's useless. You're never going to make it. It's too hard. It's too far. It's too long. You don't have enough time left. Look at you. You're old. You're going to die before you ever make anything out of this, really. Think about it. So why bother? By now you realize this work isn't easy. It's not entertaining. And it's certainly not fun. Well, there are fun moments and there are entertaining moments. But mostly what is between those is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's a very unpleasant system because it deals with wounded animals, broken machines, people who are so dysfunctional that the only place that they can function is in their imaginations. That would be us. It demands more and more effort all the time. It's not like it gets better as time goes on. It demands more as time goes on. The more you find out, the more you find out you don't know, and the more you need to find out. When the rest of the world is playing, we're working. When I was a child, there was a program on television on Saturday mornings called Our Gang. And it was Spanky and Alfalfa and Darla. And, and a lot of you remember, a lot of you probably remember Our Gang. Little black and white films. And it was just these kids in a neighborhood. And their escapades and adventures and so on and so forth. And they had their dog, Petey in case you didn't remember the dog Petey with the circle around the eye. One of the Saturday morning serials in our gang was Alfalfa was practicing, or somebody was practicing violin on Saturday morning, and all the other kids were out playing baseball, sandlot baseball. No uniforms, no baseball field, no baseball bat, no ball, no gloves. <laughs> sandlot baseball, you just go play baseball. It's like a real American game that the kids played, and you played it however you played it because you had to have ingenuity. And they all go to his house, and he's in there practicing the violin. He doesn't really want to be practicing the violin. He wants to be out there playing baseball with everybody else, with all his friends. Well, they make it worse by coming and saying, well, come on, come on. No, I've got to practice. Come on, come on, we need you for this position he plays. He wouldn't go. He stayed and practiced violin instead. And I thought, boy, that's the truth about us. There's so many times when we're practicing the violin and we're practicing the piano, we're practicing something. We're practicing self-observation. We're practicing self-remembering. We're practicing not expressing negative emotions. And all of our friends come over with just this big game of negative emotions and they want to play and we don't want to because at this moment we're practicing. We'll play in a minute, but let's get our practice over. <laughs> And then we rush out, after we're done practice, we rush out and play the negative emotion game again. Oh, that was so wonderful. <laughs> we're not likely to continue, and we certainly won't succeed without some reason to practice while the rest of the world plays. Each of you must have, by now, come to a place in yourself where you say, what is the point? Why am I doing this? This isn't working. Where is this going to lead? Where is this going to go? I don't see any benefit to this. I don't see any real goal ever being attained. I don't see me ever getting to the goal. The goal is so big. The work aim is so big that we can't, we know, we begin, we begin to know, we begin to see, I can't reach it. That's when reality sets in. And that's when people start to fade. That's when personalities are eliminated, as it were. Higher centers are always speaking to us, telling us what to do, but we can't hear them. There's always better influences that are available to us they're being broadcast to us, as it were. But our receivers are not tuned to the right station, to the right frequency, so that we don't get it. There's something that keeps us from getting it. If we don't connect observing ourselves with hearing higher centers, then all the observing that we do of ourselves is wrong. Because the purpose of observing ourselves is not to find out what monsters we are. It's to clear the way so that we can connect with the influence of higher centers because those influences can feed different parts of us and nourish different parts of us and grow different parts of us and strengthen us in ways that we need to be strengthened. And you've got to see by now that we are very weak. We lack force. And we lack force because something else is using it all. It's leaking out everywhere else and we're not getting to use it. So it's being used for things that are not beneficial to us, that are not helpful to us, that are not progressing us toward our goal, but instead are dragging us away from it. Without a conceptual grasp and an emotional life, these work ideas are no more than dry bones scattered in a graveyard. And self-observation for us remains an outer commandment. Not expressing negative emotions remains an outer commandment. Thou shalt not express negative emotions. Thou shalt observe thyself. Thou shalt not be mechanical. That's all pointless. You teach your child to be a racist, your child will be a racist. Well, how do you teach your child to be a racist? You don't sit them down and say, these people are bad, these people are good. Some parents do. 
Some parents really do that. I know, I grew up with parents like that. There are some parents who do that because that's the way they were raised. The way we teach is much more powerful. It's not just saying, it's showing everything that we do. How we say, well, they, just the way we say they, how we look at them, how we don't want anything that they touched. We don't want to be associated with what they eat or what they wear. Those are powerful impressions on a young mind. And that teaches more than anything that you say. You can say the exact opposite. It won't matter. What they will get is the most powerful impression. Words are impressions, but there are much more powerful impressions, and those are actions. And that's what they'll get. Actions, attitudes, belief systems, behaviors. We practice self-observation to become aware of influences from higher centers. That is why we practice self-observation. That is the purpose of practicing self-observation. The reason I'm telling you this is because I've noticed that recently people have been flagging. They've been stumbling. They've been teetering. They've been having a difficult time. What's the point? <laughs> What's the point? I can't make it. Why should I try? Surely I could go do something else and be happier. Yes, you probably could. In fact, I assure you, you could go do something else and be happier. How long would you stay happier? Well, I guarantee you, not more than 72 hours, but it doesn't matter. You would be happier for a time. But then you would come back to where you are now, except that then you wouldn't have the tools, then you wouldn't have the environment, then you wouldn't have the group, then you wouldn't have the teacher. And so you'd get back to where you were, but you wouldn't have what you needed, and then you'd really be in a pickle. Some of you have figured that out, and so you bite the bullet, suck it up, and you stay. And some of you teeter still. And so this is for you. We can't hear these higher centers now because there's a thick darkness of unconsciousness, a whole side of us, like the moon. We only see one side of the moon forever. We only see one side of the moon because the moon, the way it rotates and the way the earth rotates and the way the orbit is and the way the sun is, makes it so that there's only one side of the moon that faces us all the time. So the moon could go around, but it keeps that one side toward the earth. And so we only see the one side that's in the light. But the side that's in the darkness, a whole other side, we never get to see. So for us, it doesn't exist. But now it exists because we have sent satellites up there to take pictures of the dark side of the moon and actually map it so we can see what it's like. But from the Earth, we can't see it. And this is very much like what we're like. There is a conscious side of us, a side of us that we see, that faces us all the time, that we see that, we know that. Now, it's a very small side. And it's almost like, if you think about the moon, for a moment again. And if you'll think that that point of light that you see, and would you notice how bright it was last night? Yes. <laughs> Whoa. And if you'll think about that point of light that you see, now imagine that just being the point of a cone. And then imagine that the darkness behind it is the rest of the cone. And the base of that cone, obviously, is hundreds of times bigger than the point. Now you've got a more accurate analogy between what you see of yourself and what you don't know about yourself. What you don't know about yourself is like the rest of that cone in darkness. And that point that you see as the light, the big moon, is just a little point, and all the rest is in darkness. Now you have an idea of what we're up against. Now you have a clue of what this is in scale. So like the moon, there's this big part of us that is constantly in shadow. This darkness is so thick, it's palpable. Our darkness is so thick that it slows down light. It's like a black hole that can suck light into it, that can suck things into it. Our darkness is so thick and so well defended that it can go on forever and will go on forever unless we do something about it. Self-observation is the first step in doing something about it. We don't know what's in us. The act of self-observation lets a ray of light into this thick darkness. Like electricity, the influence of higher centers needs a conductor. Without a conductor, it's worthless. The problem with us is we are insulated from the influence of higher centers by this thick, rubbery darkness that is just like an insulator on an electric wire. Our darkness is like the rubber. It doesn't conduct the influences. So all self-observation must be conscious effort. It can't be mechanical. It has to be conscious. And it has to be conscious effort because anything conscious for us is effort. Anything mechanical for us is effortless. It takes no effort whatsoever to be mechanical. We do that automatically. Automatic, me mechanical. It's the same thing. 
So all of our automatic responses don't do us any good. It's only our conscious responses, the ones that stop us, that are painful to us, that are difficult for us. Those are the ones that do us some good. Why can't children learn by playing video games? They can. It's just that we don't want them to learn what they're learning. We don't want them to learn how to be slugs. We don't want them to learn how to be lazy. We don't want them to learn how to waste an entire day doing nothing that actually stimulates their brain in any kind of meaningful way. People now are working to try and find some redemptive value to video games. In Japan, it's a big thing. You have Brain Age, which is a program that is raging in Japan that stimulates the frontal cortex. So it has exercises and things that stimulate the frontal cortex because we are not getting enough blood flow to our brains because we're so mechanical, because we're not making effort. The problem is with this, you can't just do the exercises. You have to do them as fast as you can. So you're constantly pressing the envelope. You're constantly pushing yourself. You're constantly giving yourself a headache. You're constantly pushing yourself up against it. Now, how often in a day do we do that? Well, we think we do it all the time. I got up and went to the kitchen and got a beer. <laughs> I didn't tell the kids to do it. I, just, I think that's a big step. Yeah, that's a huge step. I'm really proud of you. You get a gold star for that. But you get my point, right? We call that effort. That's not effort, people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real effort. I'm not sure I can define what real effort is now, but it'll come as we go on. We're full of pictures of ourselves. And these pictures are separated by buffers. That's what the work says, that these pictures of ourselves are separated by buffers. When asked what a buffer was, Gurdjieff said, it's like a piece of wood. Let me explain it to you in another way. These pictures are in an album, and in the album are pages. And these pictures are separated by pages. So these pictures on one page don't see the pictures on the other page. Here we have these pictures of ourselves. We keep them in order. We're very clever this way, very mechanical this way. We keep them in order. All the lovely pictures of us being superstars are on this page. All the pictures of us failing and being jerks are on some other page in the back of the album. Those two never. There's so many pages between them that it's like it may as well be in a different album. And if that's not enough, we'll put it in a different album and then put that album in the basement. That's what buffers are. Buffers are the things that keep us from seeing the contradictions and enable a degree of contentment and peace within ourselves. Because if we saw those contradictions, we wouldn't be at peace. If we could see those contradictions, we would not be contented with who we are. But folks, if you can have just a moment of looking at yourself honestly and sincerely, you're going to have to tell the truth and say, well, I'm pretty contented with myself. Oh, there's a couple of things I'd like to change but not enough to do anything about it. So that's pretty contented with yourself. How many people need to lose weight? How many people are doing anything about it? Really doing something about it. In other words, how many of you are losing weight? Okay, well, that's two out of the whole group that, <laughs> that said they wanted to lose weight. That's really not that great, is it? Of all the people who want to lose weight, only two are actually losing weight. So then two are actually doing something about it. Is it an effort? Yes, it's an effort, isn't it? And is it an effort not to lose weight? No, it's no effort at all, is it? It's just as easy as, yeah, this is like waking up in the morning. <laughs> this is easy. I like this. This is good. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that kind of effort. The kind of effort that gets results. The kind of effort that something happens. You remember back a while back, I wanted to gain weight. And so I had to make an effort to gain weight. It was a huge effort. I had to change my diet. I had to change my routine. I had to change this. I had to change that. There were so many things I had to change, and I really didn't like it. But fortunately, I got into the swing of things, and now I'm, well, I've gained weight. I guess that's the only way to put it. I've gained weight. Now I'm at a place where I'm looking at it like, well, now I've got to make a decision. Now I've gained weight. My pants are tighter. So either I've got to go buy new pants, or I've got to lose weight. Well, it's easier to go buy new pants, but I like to lose weight. And I like to lose weight because it makes me feel like I'm doing something that takes effort. It makes me feel like I'm going against the machine. And there's a reason for that, because it does take effort. I am going against the machine, and I am doing something. I like to do that. Do I really like to do that? No, I don't like to do that at all. I hate making effort, but I like the results of making effort. I like what happens when I make effort. I like to see that I can make effort. Unfortunately, I work for results. Self-observation is a method used to become more conscious of what's in us and gradually lose imaginary I. 
Imaginary I is this I made up of all of these pictures in the album that we keep, of our gloriousness, how wonderful we are. In other words, the driver must awaken. You remember the story, parable, the work parable of the driver, the carriage driver in the bar. And he's in there drunk on imagination. He's in there drinking imagination. The carriage is outside or the taxi's outside and the tires are flat and somebody came along and stole the steering wheel and somebody else came along and stole the wheels and somebody else came along and stole the engine. And it's just in disrepair and it's a, it's a carcass out there. And he's just in there staying drunk on imagination, spending all of his force on that instead of out there getting fares, doing his job, keeping the taxi maintained, keeping his job going and like that, he's instead in there satisfying himself with imagination. He first has to awaken. We each have this dark side which acts without our awareness. You understand what that means? We have a dark side that acts without our awareness. We end up doing things that we were not aware that we were doing. Well, how did that happen? Oh, people did it. Life did it. No, you did it. Well, your unconscious acts. Well, I don't see that. Right. It's unconscious. Well, how can you prove that? Oh, I can prove it but it won't do you any good for me to prove it. The only good you will get out of it is if you prove it yourself. But you'll have to give something up in order to do that, and that's going to have to be a buffer. You're going to have to give up the idea that you're perfect, that you always do the right thing, that you're always conscious, that you're always awake. You have to give that up. It's a very difficult thing to give up. Just the idea of that is offensive. We've got this dark side which acts without our awareness, and into this darkness, self-observation must introduce a ray of light. But light alone won't serve. We've got to know for what to look, how to observe, and of what to become aware. See, this work is not just, oh yeah, just let the light in, that'll solve everything. No, it won't. Let's say that you could take all of the pages out of the album and have all the pictures all right there. And what you would have is confusion. What you would have is madness. No order whatsoever. That's why we put them in the album, so that we can have some order so that we find things. That's why they're there. There is a purpose for everything that we do. The problem is, is that the mechanical purpose for everything that we do leads us where mechanical things lead us, and conscious effort leads us in a different direction. But we don't make enough conscious effort to get moving in that direction. Because we make so much mechanical effort, we're on greased skids going to where that leads. And it's down. It's a descending octave. It's not an ascending octave. It's not taking us under fewer laws. It's taking us under more laws. The more mechanical we are, the more laws we are under. The less mechanical we are, the fewer laws we are under. Fewer laws means more freedom. More laws means less freedom. So light alone won't serve. We've got to know what we're looking for. We've got to know how to observe. And we've got to become aware. We have to know of what we need to become aware. You turn the lights on, wow, it's, all of a sudden it's this massive confusion. You see all these things you didn't see before. How do you categorize? How do you know which is more important? How do you know which to work on first? How do you know what to move first? It's like turning the lights on, there's a room full of levers, and you've got to find which levers to throw in order to have the... <laughs> it reminds me of a Flash Gordon cereal. Flash always would end up in some room with spikes coming down from the top and spikes coming up from the bottom. The floor and the ceiling are coming together and flashes in this and next week you've got to find out how you get out of it. So it's like that. You're in this room and the ceiling is coming down with spikes and the floor is coming up with spikes and it's just a matter of time till you're spiked. And you've got to find the right combination of levers and unless you know which levers to pull and in which order, then the ceiling and the floor are going to come together and you're going to be spiked. And that's our state. So we've got to know which levers to pull, which levers to leave alone, which way to throw those levers. The work teaches us that. It's not just as simple as turning on the lights. Turning on the lights is the first step. You've got to wake up. Good. That's great. You wake up. You see that you're in the bar. You see that you're drinking, pounding down the imagination, and you haven't a clue what's real. That's the first step. That's great. But there's more to it. The dark side must gradually be connected with our idea of ourselves. Instead, we see it in other people. What does that mean? The dark side of us must gradually be connected with our idea of ourselves. Well, slowly we've got to introduce this whole dark side as part of us. Oh, but no, that's why it's dark. It's not part of me. No, no, but it is. Well, that's unpleasant. Don't tell me that. Well, yes, it is unpleasant. But you said you wanted to be who you are. Well, to be who you are, you are going to have to be all of who you are not just the parts that you think are good. 
You have to accept all of you. Well, this is a very difficult thing mm -hmm. because we've made a lot of judgments mm -hmm. about what's on the dark side. And it's been mostly about other people because that's where we put it. We don't ever see it in ourselves. We say it's out there and we condemn it out there. And once we've condemned it out there, we're loath to locate it in ourselves. So as you judge, so are you judged. Ouch! The practice of that is difficult to bear. We tend to blame others, accuse them of evil thoughts, bad talking, lying, unkindness, indifference, infidelity, meanness, unreliableness, all that stuff. All that stuff that inhabits our dark side. No, I'm not unreliable. Yes, you are. Oh, I'm not a liar. Yes, you are. I'm not mean. Oh, yes, you are. You can be as mean as a snake. And if you don't know that about yourself, you haven't been observing yourself as an interesting stranger. Get busy. Let some light in. You'll see it. It's there. It's not that hard to see. We all see it. We don't have any trouble seeing it, do we, in each other? No, we only have trouble seeing it in ourselves. When we deliberately observe in ourselves that for which we blame others, we've really begun to work. Deliberately observe in ourselves. Deliberately observe. I've tripped over some things in myself. I wasn't deliberately observing them. I tripped over some things. Oh, <coughs> who left that there? <laughs> Damn kids! But I have deliberately observed things, those same things in myself. And it's like, there it is. I went looking for it and I found it. Oh, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not really there. You just made it up. You're just imagining things. No, it's really there. It's really there. That's it. The trick is to deliberately observe in yourself that for which you have blamed others. We're like people trying to see through a window painted black. The problem is the black paint is ourselves. We are the darkness that is keeping us from seeing what it is we say we want to see. This is a big problem. We don't think of ourselves as darkness, but we are. We're not just in the darkness, we are actually the darkness. We have a system set up to keep that window black, no matter how much some little part of us tries to scrape it away. And it's a thick darkness. You know the darkness I'm talking about. A darkness so thick that you can almost taste it and feel it and smell it. It's like it has substance. It really is palpable. That's the darkness I'm talking about. It's a living darkness. We're not just living in darkness, it's our living darkness. Bit by bit, we lose ordinary ideas of ourselves, and we feel lost, insecure, weak. So we all have ordinary ideas of ourselves. I'm a good father, I'm a good mother, I'm a good wife, I'm a good husband, I'm a good this, I'm a good employee. I'm really a good person, you know, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal, I don't do those things. You know, I obey the Ten Commandments and blah, 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 blah. You know, all of the stuff we believe about ourselves. And then we begin to observe and we see that it's not always that way. We have these little blips on the radar screen and we see that we act in this way that's just not like what we think we are. And they go, oh, well, so-and-so made me do that. But when you see that so-and-so can't make you do anything that isn't already in you, when you begin to see and accept, yes, that's in me, that's in me, and I've kept it down or I've kept it in the dark or I've kept it hidden from myself, that's usually what we do. When we push it away, we keep it hidden from ourselves. And the reason is we think that we're being better people, but we're actually just dividing ourselves into two. It's one conscious and one unconscious, and the unconscious side becomes greater. It's like the garage. When you stop parking your car in the garage and you just put stuff in the garage, it's just a matter of time before the garage is going to be full of stuff that you don't know what's in there. That's what our dark side is like. We put so much stuff over there, we don't even know what's there anymore, and it's useless. You couldn't park a car in there. You couldn't get anything in there except more stuff. We're the same kind of stuff. We just throw it in there now. But what happens as we begin to observe ourselves is we start to lose our ordinary idea of ourselves. And we lose that and we start to feel uncomfortable. It's a very unpleasant sensation because your images, your imagination, your fantasy about yourself is being slowly removed and you're left with this uneasy feeling of, I might not be as nice as I thought I was. And then you deal with that and you find out there's even more. So new thoughts, feelings, insights, and meanings begin to come to us at that point. Traces of higher influences begin to be heard. We realize that there is some value in the strength and the will and the courage it takes to see what we're like. We realize there's some value in that, and that even leads to even more value. That that leads to something that's even more strengthening. It's strange, it's different, but it's real. And we feel it, we know it, we sense it. We saw one way. And now we see many more meanings and choices. they are finer and finer differences, subtler meanings. And beauty begins to increase. How does beauty increase? Where it used to be, this is right, this is wrong. There's no beauty in that. You can do that with an axe. You can chop that with an axe. 
you can split everything into two. You can tear things in two. There's nothing refined and subtle and beautiful about that. But when you begin to see another person's point of view, and you begin to see that you're both right, then you have found a beauty and a subtleness that you never had before when it was just this or that. This is what we're looking for. This is the influence that comes from higher centers. This is why we bother observing ourselves. This leads to a complete change in our estimation of ourselves. We begin to feel positive uncertainty. We're uncertain about ourselves. I'm a flake. I don't know what I can be counting on to do, but I feel good about it because this is a positive change. This is a move in the right direction. Yes, I'm awkward. Yes, I feel like a child learning how to walk, but still, I really am learning how to walk, and it's a real walk now. It's not a mechanical thing. I'm really moving my feet, my own feet, and I know that I'm doing it. This is a very positive change, even though it's a very awkward stage. There's a new strength in that, and it's a strength that goes deep. It's a strength that's rooted in something very, very strong, rooted in something real. It's grounded, as it were. The certainty that we felt was simply foolishness based on ignorance. When you were young, and you were so sure of everything, now you look at it and you go, what a fool I was. <laughs> did I really say that? Oh, did I really do that? I hope nobody remembers that. You know what I mean? So that certainty that we felt was foolishness based on ignorance. We see how mechanical we are and how mechanical we were. When you see how mechanical you were and how mechanical you are, it's a mixed feeling. It feels good, but it feels awful. But there is this positive uncertainty about it. The doctrine of eyes is indispensable with self-observation because we can't identify with what we see. If we identify with what we see, it's fatal. You're looking at yourself. You're letting light in. You begin to see some of the stuff that's in the dark side. You put it there for a good reason. When you start to see that, if you identify with that, well, that's me. It's fatal. You're lost. What good are you then? You just slide into the dark side. You're lost there. That's not the purpose of this work. The purpose of this work is not to make you a dark being. The purpose of this work is to make you a whole being, to heal you, to bring the two sides of you together in a harmony and a power that you do not now have, but that is possible. That's why we bother. Well, but you're never going to do it. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. The question is, can you get something for yourself in your life today? Not, are you going to make it before you die? That's not important. The important part is, are you willing to make the effort now? and get something now, because you will get something now. You may not get the big prize now, but you will get something. This is why we are told not to work for results, because we get lost in, oh, I'm not making it. It doesn't mean you don't work for results. It means you don't work for results. You don't base your effort on the fact that if I don't get results, I'm not going to make any more effort. No, you work because it's there to do and you'll get results. You don't deny the results just because we don't work for results. Oh, well, I've got results, but I don't want them. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. That's formatory thinking. You can't do this work with one idea of it. If you identify with everything that you see when you're looking inside, you're going down fast. It will harm you. Make no mistake about this. It's dangerous. To see things inside of yourself that we've kept in the dark side and to identify with them is dangerous. That can get out of hand fast. People get depressed, people get despondent, people get suicidal, people get whacked out, they lose it. It's not a good idea. Don't identify with that stuff. Don't become what you observe. We've got to take our eyes objectively, like objects in this room. You've got to divide into two, the observed and the observing side. Okay, what does it mean to observe? Here's what it means to observe. There's a piano bench. It is not the piano. I can tell the difference between the piano bench and the piano, no problem. I'm not that piano bench and I'm not that piano. No problem. I know that. Somebody sits on me and starts trying to play the piano. I'm not going to make nice sounds like a piano might. So I know there's a difference. But the problem is, is when we see something in ourselves, we immediately begin to identify with it. I think this. I feel that. Well, I think that, that I, I, feel like you, I feel like you're this and I think you're that. <laughs> no, don't identify with that stuff. Look at it as an object separate from you, apart from you like objects in this room, so that I'm over here and it's over there. You separate, you divide from it. You keep in mind what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. You are aware of what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. You are aware that you're over here and it's over there, that you are observing it. It's an object, not you. That's real self-observation. It's very difficult, but it can be learned. If I consent to what I observe, I become what I observe. If I keep them back by force, I touch them and they rob my force by getting part of my feeling of I. See, I observe these thoughts in me. 
These mean, little, critical, nasty thoughts that always snipe at people. Oh, well, he's just this and she's just that. And then I feel superior. So I like to identify with those feelings of superiority. But in order to identify with those feelings of superiority, I've got to identify with those eyes that are sniping. Well, they're very harmful because those very eyes that I've been feeding your flesh to, when they get hungry enough, they'll turn around and eat mine. So it's a very dangerous thing to do. Nothing stops us. Danger means nothing to us. We'll throw anybody to the piranha. Doesn't matter. Well, we'll get us later. I'll deal with that later. Right now I'm enjoying myself. But another thing is we try and force them away. And we're laying our hands on them. It's just like a grabbing a hot electrical wire without any insulation. That energy is going to go through you. It's going to rob your life from you if you hold on to it long enough. Electricity will kill you. Did you know that? Yes, it's called electrocution. You stay connected to enough electricity long enough, you'll die. It will burn you to death or shock you to the point that your internal organs quit working. So we've got to stay insulated from that. We can't get hold of them because they begin to rob our force because we have put some of our feeling of I in them when we identified with them. And our force is all in my sense of I. My sense of I is the greatest power that I have, where I put my sense of I. So that's why it's so important to put our sense of I in our real self the real essential part of us, not this other acquired part of us that's false personality that's made up by the world. I've got to stay within this magic circle that I've drawn around myself by not identifying with the observed side. You see, when you don't identify, it's like a magic golden circle you draw around yourself. And as long as you stay in that circle of not identifying with whatever it is you're observing, you're fine, you're safe. The moment you step out of that circle, you have just stepped into a tank full of hungry rats who will devour you. Stay in that circle. Don't identify with what you're observing. Anything in that observed side, anything in that dark side, anything that you observe. And fear not. Don't be afraid to observe anything there. Have no fear of that. There's nothing there that can hurt you as long as you don't identify. The moment you identify, you're feeding yourself to it. And where there's one, there's more. They run in packs and they got big teeth and they're hungry. So don't identify with them. They are not you. They are what you're observing. Doesn't matter how they got there. Whether you put them there, somebody else put them there, whether they grew there out of the darkness, doesn't matter. All that matters is that you observe without identifying. This is why we bother.